following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The title of our lecture is The Machinery of the Soul. I chose this title in order to help us reflect or uh, help us begin to maybe think about what this, um, this word, or these, these common words that we use, for example, the soul, or the spirit, or God, how that relates with a certain type of mechanism and how it relates to a certain type of work. Uh, at first glance, we may not always correlate the word machinery with the word soul. That doesn't seem to make quite sense. But we're going to first take a look at the definition, the common definition of what a machine is. And we'll read, it is an apparatus consisting of interrelated parts with separate functions used in the performance of some kind of work. So in relationship to our spiritual studies, our esoteric studies, we know that there is a spiritual work that we have to perform. There is a work upon ourselves that we need to perform. And that the great cosmic common father, the Logos, wants to perform a work, it is, it, it is looking to acquire some result. And that's the whole beginning of why this universe exists. This universe, this whole reality, has some purpose. Sometimes uh, Samael Unveor will state that the solar logos wants to perform an experiment. And what he means by this is the solar logos, or Christ, wants to know all of its inner parts completely. And all those, we are, as monads, a part of the universal spirit of life. But that universal spirit of life wishes to always know itself more. In order to do that, a certain process unvolved, uh, un unfolds. And that process needs to unfold or unfolds in a certain way in order for all these particles, which are our spirits, to know itself better. So the soul is a part of that. The abstract, unmanifested God, or deity, or seity, as we say, purposefully manifests itself in different types of limited forms. It projects itself into limitations. It creates laws and submits itself to those very same laws. It, being a unity, divides itself into different ways, so it can relate to its own self, reflect upon its own self, and return 
back to that unity again. And this is how the abstract reality can begin to know itself through some type of relationship. So there's many different ways that we can talk about the unfolding of this universe, and we've talked about it in many lectures. For here, we're going to simply look at things, even if it's just on a simpler level. I have this slide here titled Solar Systems, and that word in, in a common usage means, just as this picture represents, which is some star or our sun and different planets rotating around it. There is a certain order to that. It's not chaotic. It seems to sustain itself, at least for a very long period of time. That is a system which is ordered by the sun. The sun's gravity, from just a materialistic standpoint, is the principal law which is causing these different forces to rotate around. But when we use the word solar, from a Gnostic or esoteric standpoint, we're pointing towards something else at the same time. The word solar, from a symbolic standpoint, means something that's in alignment with God or Christ. So a solar system would be any type of system that is obeying the law or is functioning within the law of Christ. Any solar system like this of a sun, that sun represents some spirit. In a similar sense, we have a spirit, but our spirit isn't like that sun's spirit. And all those planets represent a spirit as well. All those planets represent some self-realized monad or spirit. So those are the physical bodies related to some spirit. We have a physical body, But our spirit is not like those spirits, those physical bodies. And we have a system within ourselves. We have various systems, organs, nervous systems. And they operate, and they relate to each other, and they keep us alive. But the system that is going on inside of us, even physically, is not a solar system. We use another word, lunar which indicates that there's some type of intelligence there, but the intelligence is related to a lunar level of intelligence. It's still related to God. There's still something related to the Spirit, but it's not completed. There's only only an aspect there. If we were to transform not just our physical body, but our soul and our spirit to incarnate all these laws and to manifest them, then we would be a, at the level where we could manage the energy of, of a whole planet, a whole physical planet. We, as in our level of consciousness right now, we cannot even manage this little body that we have. We constantly do things in ways that harm it, and we constantly do things that harm other people, even if it's just in our mind, even if it's just a moment of having ill will towards another person. That's not a solar system. That's a, that's, that's a lunar system, but even really even below that. So the soul has different parts. The soul begins by a projection out of the spirit. We speak about the septenary, or the sevenfold aspect of our being. And we relate that to the tree of life. So one thing is our spirit, and another thing is our soul. And then finally is our vitality in our physical body. So if we start at the very bottom of this sevenfold nature of our, of our inner constitution. We start with our physical body. Obviously, it's very easy to see our physical body. Just above that is the superior aspect of our physical body, which is the energetic or vital aspect, our vitality. 
It is the energy that sustains our life. Without the vitality, then the physical body is just a corpse. It's just a bunch of material organized in a certain way, but there's no vitality, that there's no life. So we have our physical body, and we have our vital body. And then we have a body related to emotions and desires, and then we have a body related to the mind. In an ordinary person, this is what we would call the soul, from a very basic sense. There's also something else called the causal body, or the human soul, but we don't have that yet. We have to develop that. What we have is just a seed. You see, we think that creation happens like that, in a snap. We think that we're already, just because we have this physical body, that our inner constitution is complete. That's a huge mistake. We need to clarify that actually creation happens in a process. And we are not completed yet. We have the ability to choose whether we want to continue to work on ourselves or not. And that's the work that we need to perform. So we have emotions, we have reasoning, we have our willpower, but none of these things are fully developed. None of these things are solar. These things are lunar. We were, we were assisted to be at the place that we are right now. We didn't manifest ourselves. We didn't self-manifest our body or our soul or our spirit. We were placed here through a process. And how, did you, how did we get placed here? We got placed here by other intelligences. Perhaps we can call them angels or archangels. But those angels or archangels are those beings which have completed that process of self-realization. And inside of them, they have a solar system, a system of managing energies that's completely conscious, completely cognizant. There's no unconsciousness. There's no, there's no dreaming. There's no fascination. So, <clears throat> if our inner spirit wants to know about itself, a great process has to unfold. It needs to project an aspect of itself we call the essence, which is the seed of our soul, the seed of a human soul. It's not developed, but it is the seed. In the same way that we can place a seed into the earth, it's only when that seed is placed into the earth and given some certain materials and energy, water and sun, and uh, nitrogen, other chemicals, that things start to develop. And that seed develops into its full blossoming. So us as a soul, the most precious thing we have is this essence isn't fully developed. In order to develop that, in order to know ourselves, we have to be able to work with the very fundamental primary forces of the universe. And those are the three primary forces. This is why we find a trinity in various religions. In Christianity, it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the Tree of Life, or the Kabbalah, it's related to Keter, Chokmah, and Binah. And we could list many different trinities. But the, the point is that trinity represents a fundamental threefoldness of creation. Because creation is a process of, of the, what is formless becoming into form. And the simplest geometric shape is a triangle. So those, three, those three forces are represented there. So we need to become conscious of those three forces. The only way that we can is to develop a type of apparatus or series of apparatuses or machinery that can relate to those three forces. So in the beginning, the human soul, this essence, has no knowledge of itself. It's ignorant in an innocent way. 
in a virginal way, innocent. And that innocent type of elemental consciousness, that essence, is the same principle that eventually could become the manager of, an, of a whole star or a constellation. So it's the same principle. So how do we get from that, that seed of consciousness to a type of consciousness which could organize and be conscious of an entire planet, or series of planets, or a constellation? We have to begin at the very absolute beginning. And the essence gets deposited into the earth, into the matter. The word matter and the word mother are related. So that seed, that essence, gets put into the earth, into a type of physical existence. Because inside that physical existence are all those nutrients, all those elements which have to come together, which can come together, in order to form certain things which we're going to talk about. We call the three brains. And it's through those three brains that we can begin to know ourselves So on this slide, it's uh, a picture of the evolving and devolving energies. So this whole Earth, as we said before, is a, is a living being. It's the physical body of some spirit or God. Logos is, we, is the word that we use. So that Logos is managing a whole earth of forces. And those forces need to be handled in such a way that it harmonizes with all the other planets of the solar system. Because the solar system is also a, a system, a, a living being, you could say. And if one planet didn't manage its own energy correctly, then it would infect the whole solar system. And that solar system wouldn't be able to be a part of a larger system of stars. In the same way, we have cells in our body, and we have organs in our body, and if, if one of those organs don't manage our energy correctly, if it gets sick, then it infects or causes the whole body to get sick. So we needed all of our organs to be managing the things that they need to manage correctly, right? If a single cell begins to act upon its own will or upon its own accord and begins to divide and multiply at its own rate, under its own will, we could say, unchecked by any laws, that cell would become cancer. That is what cancer is. All it is is different ways, many thousands of different ways that a cell can begin to multiply without any regard to the bigger system. And that is representative of a part of the system not working correctly, right? So the earth has to manage all the energies of this earth. At the same time, all of, the, all of life, straight from every, everything that's alive, is connected to some monad or some spirit. Every living entity, not just animals, but plants as well. And if you think about that, that's a lot. It's incomprehensible. And if you think of the gradations of life, it starts at the most elementary type of existence and works itself up. And that's the process that it needs to go through. In fact, matter itself it's directly related to energy and consciousness. In the modern world, we see a relationship. We know that matter and energy are two halves of the same thing. Einstein proved that. But we forget about the third element, which is consciousness. So every particle of matter relates to energy, matter, and consciousness. So there's consciousness in every atom. That's the beginning level of material consciousness, being that essence being placed into what we call the mineral kingdom. That type of experience is very difficult for us to understand and to conceptualize. We have to meditate on that. 
because it's very, very different. There's not very much individuality, but there's a very small amount of energy that can be handled and manipulated on an atomic level to be kind of the supervisor of that energy. What do we mean by that? It means that minerals can interact. They have properties. Electricity can go through them. Copper, for example, different veins of copper or iron that can run through the earth. Those veins are like our veins, which carry energy. But those those different types of metals and minerals, they transmit energy related to the cosmos. So an elemental essence gets deposited at that level to just manage a certain type of energy, to just begin to manage. And then a lot of experiences have to happen. And that's, it's managed also by superior intelligences. So these innocent elemental consciousnesses are under the guidance of these great beings that are kind of supervising the different waves of energy that go through the earth. So after an enormous amount of time, through a mechanical process, it's mechanical, but it's also intelligent because the, the, the archangels are managing that with their intelligence, but they're, they are causing this, this evolution to occur. So the elementals are gaining some type of experience, but they're not, they don't have a choice. They're just gaining these experiences kind of in a mechanical sense. But it is experience, and it allows for a development. It's necessary. Because the second level, the second kingdom is called the plant kingdom. So those elementals that were first, were originally related to uh, minerals now get deposited in very, very simple type of plant existences. And if you were to look and imagine all the variation of vegetation and life in that sense, you have the most basic types of, of uh, moss or fungus, and it goes all the way up into you know, beautiful flowers, um, the Venus flytrap, that actually can move and things like that. So there's this, there's this evolution. When I say evolution, I'm talking about the, I'm talking about the a mechanical process that the soul is undergoing to gain more experience. This is different, we should be very clear, this is different than the evolution of a species. Any physical species can change over time. Um, but the soul within that species is evolving in an, on a different wave. The soul will evolve in a different wave that a physical manifestation of that species would evolve. So those, those, those species are like anything. They can change in accordance with the environment. However, this idea that evolution can reach a pinnacle of the human body without any direction, without any deity or intelligent force, that can never happen. So that, that type of, that theory of evolution, that through just pure mechanics, that there's no intelligent force at all, is a, a sophism. There can be, the intelligence exists first, which is that God, whatever you want to call it, that guides the evolutionary process. It guides the processes of different physical bodies, species changing, but it's also guiding the souls within those species to change. And when the soul becomes developed at a certain level, then it can graduate to a more complicated physical body and begins to manage a little bit more energy. So the plant kingdom, you begin to see that the plant kingdom, the plants have, we can conceptualize the plants have a, a physical existence, a physical body, you can see that. It's much more, it's more difficult to see how the minerals have a physical body. It, it exists in a more abstract sense. So the plant kingdom is more complicated. It handles more energy. 
And those, that energy, you see, as, a, as an essence, you gain the experience to handle more complicated forms of energy. But also, it's necessary for the earth to transform all these different types of energy. The earth needs to transform energy related to the mineral kingdom. The earth needs to transform energy related to the plant kingdom and also to the animal and humanoid kingdoms. Why is that? That's the same, if you look at all the different organs of our physical body, there's a lot of different types of organ systems. They handle different types of energy. You know, they're all necessary. Except the earth exists in space, and there's a lot of invisible cosmic type of rays that we're not aware of that are, that are going into the earth and related to the whole solar system. We might know that there's certain types of radiation in space, cosmic radiation, x-rays, and other types of radiation. But we don't, materialistic science doesn't understand what's really going on there. But those, but that energy is similar to the different types of energy that's going to go through our body. We have energy in our blood. We have chemical processes going on in our blood all the time. But our life exists on a cellular level. So the, en the exchange of energy happens within and between cells and breaking uh, energetic bonds to liberate energy and run the human machine. But the solar system outside in space is using magnetism and electricity to transmit that energy and other types of energy that we're not aware of. It's electronic. So operating in an electronic sense, right? So we, we're talking about the plant kingdom. The, so through an evolving process, those plants are existing on the outside, mostly on the outside of the earth. And it forms a biological membrane around the physical crust of the earth. So there's a thin layer of life that exists. And that layer of life is receiving, transforming, and transmitting energy. Energy within itself and also energy going down into the earth. So this is why dense jungles and forests are necessary. This is why oceans are necessary from a cosmic standpoint. They all transform different types of energy. All the trees are transforming energy. We know from a physical standpoint, we need those trees to, to, to preserve an ecological economy, to preserve our nature, right? But there's more going on than just the physical things that we can identify. So then finally we get to the animal kingdom, and the animal kingdom, again, if we look at all the different variations of animals, they go from very simple to very complex to animals that seem to even be able to start to have some rationalization. The pinnacle of the animal kingdom is us, which you call the humanoid kingdom. We don't call it the human kingdom because the human kingdom is solar. The humanoid kingdom is something that looks like a human, but it's gotten there through a lunar mechanical process. But the animals now are really starting to handle a lot of complex energy. And you have animals which are cold-blooded, and you have animals which are warm-blooded. And, and you can see that the warm-blooded animals even seem to be more evolved and handling even more energy. And then eventually, you see some of these animals that are, they seem to be quite uh, complicated and have sophisticated um, types of communication and are able to figure things out and uh, have social structure. So that represents more and more types of complicated forms of energy. Finally, that process reaches its pinnacle with being put into a physical body like ours. So our physical body represents a pinnacle of, of evolution. So not only does the universe have to create and descend and create all this matter and energy, but then our essence has to be deposited in there at the mineral kingdom and then evolve up to the current state that we're at now. And that's just to begin. That's just to have the capacity to do this work. 
So all that other stuff was, you can't even do the work of realizing those three forces within yourself because we don't have the, we don't have the machinery to do it. Not until you're at that humanoid kingdom. So where we are at now is extremely beneficial, extremely, I almost want to use the word lucky, but it's not, it's not lucky, but it, it takes a long time. It's a very beneficial state. We will not have it forever. We'll be born for a certain amount of time in this humanoid kingdom. But just as this process, we didn't have any of our own self-will in the evolving curve. We were brought up into this state. We have, if we don't do anything, if we don't do the work, that same current reaches a pinnacle and then begins to go down. So what is at one moment evolving, those same energies, those same forces reach a pinnacle and they just keep going and then they start to devolve. And it's mechanical as well. Unless we do a work, a solar work within ourselves, the lunar forces will just keep taking us. They took us up and they'll take us down. They gave us all of this, this magnificent body and what we'll talk about next, which are internal lunar bodies as well. They gave us the capacity to have reasoning and emotions, but it will also take it away unless we manifest something within ourselves. That's the whole point. And just as everything in nature is recycled, so will our body be recycled. Our, our type of lunar mind that we have, our type of lunar reasoning, and our type of capacity to have emotions, it was all developed mechanically. We didn't do the work for ourselves. We were given that as a gift. But that represents a complication of energy. And that energy would begin to unwind and will have to be taken away from our essence. And that's not a very pleasant process. It's, it, it's a difficult process that for, that, for that energy to be taken out of that essence. That energy has to be given to the next, the next wave of evolving elementals because the energy is always conserved. The energy has to be taken away. It has, that's why we call this descent, which is the descent into the inferior or inferno, we call it a, a recycling. It's very literally a recycling of energy. So, we talked about the three forces vaguely. So these three factors, these three forces become capable we can uh, begin to work with these three forces within ourselves only, as a, only in the humanoid kingdom because we have what are called the three brains, as opposed to having only two brains or one brain. So the three brains might sound like a, a strange terminology again, but what we're really saying is three nervous systems. So we can identify the intellectual brain related to our cerebral spinal nervous system. So our brain and our spine. This is the brain that we commonly refer to as being the brain. But there's another, there are other nervous systems. The emotional brain is related to our solar plexus. It's related to, depending if it's a superior emotion or an inferior emotion, we'll feel it in the middle of our body. If you think of any powerful emotion, such as uh, grief, where do you feel that grief? You, really, you feel it here. You, can, you almost keel over in grief, or if you feel pride, where do you feel pride in your body? You feel puffed up with pride and your shoulders lift up, and it's related to your heart and to your solar plexus as well. But the emotional center may be centered here in the chest, but it exists throughout the whole body because it's a nervous system. It's related to the grand sympathetic nervous system. And then there's a third brain, which is the motor instinctual sexual brain. And this is also related to our spinal cord, our spinal column, and is related to exactly what it says there, to our movement, which is the, which is the 
the top of our spine, our instincts, instinctual reactions, and to our sexual impulses, which goes related to our sexual organs. And again, we may point to those areas, but all three of these brains exist throughout the entire body. But but those are the centers. We're going to talk more about that in a second. So we can see through this evolutionary process of of being placed in more and more complicated types of uh, bodies, those are related to what we can call one, two, and three brained machines. I have a picture of an insect, a lion, and a businessman. So we can see that an insect has the ability to move, right? It has a motor sense. It has, a, it has one brain. There may be, oh, you know, in an insect, you probably would not be able to see any type of emotions or intellect, right? But there, so you can clearly see there's one type of brain there. And as you get more and more complicated, you might even have uh, cold-blooded animals. They're more complicated, but they really still only have one brain. They may begin to have this second nervous system being developed, but there's not a clear emotional sense in a, like a cold-blooded animal. When you get to a warm-blooded animal, that, that warm-bloodedness is very much related to that second force, which is the emotional sense, which is Christ uh, in a uh, logoic sense. So as the animals, they start to get warm-blooded, you get to clearly see that there's an emotional sense in those types of animals. And maybe some with a greater emotional sense and some with a less. So t- any type of complicated animal or most of the, the pets that we have have, a, have two brains and they have that emotional sense, but they're not intellectual. They may be able to have a, they may be able to make a choice or have some very limited type of primitive reasoning, but there's not an intellectual center there. It's not until we get to the intellectual animal, to the humanoid, that we finally have the third brain developed. And again, once we have the three brains developed, now we have the, the, the proper apparatus to be cognizant of the three forces that manifest in our life, within ourselves and outside of ourselves. So one way of understanding this is to look at the, the, the brain, the first brain that gets developed is related to actually the third force, which is called the third logos. And the first brain that gets developed is the motor instinctual sexual brain. And you can see that first brain is a relationship to the external world and the surface of the body. There's a movement in the external world. That dimension of life starts to open up. We say that that those types of insects or primitive type of animals live one-dimensionally because they live amongst this idea of an external world. But the internal world isn't really tangible until you get to that second brain. That second brain, we talk about emotions, which is related to that second brain. Our emotions are related to our interior world. Now we have a relationship between the exterior world and the interior world. And that interior world is fueled by that warm-bloodedness. The second logos is related to the sun, to Christ. <clears throat> related to the emotional center. And then that third brain, which is the thinking brain, finally provides some types of uh, synthesis, which is an abstraction between that external world and the internal world. The, brain ha- the thinking brain has the ability to conceptualize that relationship, to see it. And that's it's important and necessary. So 
So that's how these, these three brains then give us the capacity to become conscious of those three forces. And we feel and experience those three forces through primarily you know, thinking, feeling, and our movement, instinct, and sexual impulses. So any experience that we have in life, we can relate to the three brains. We are all in a state of psychological disequilibrium. All of us are predisposed to use one of these three brains out of balance. Or in, but in synthesis, we're always using them all out of balance. But we even have a particular psychological bias towards one or another. So, for example, there are people who view life strictly through an intellectual sense. They put the intellect or rationality as um, primary above all other dimensions of their experience. So they may be very cold to emotions. They may deny or reject the, the emotional dimension of life. And that may cause them, because they ignore it, they become ignorant of it. And they become ignorant of how they are causing problems for themselves. They can't know themselves, they can't figure out their problems, or they cause problems for other people because they don't have that center used well. They have no balance in it. They don't know how to, they don't know how to face life using that center. So, someone who is more of unbalanced emotionally would be the opposite of that. They'll see everything through an emotion and will kind of discount reasoning or logic. And that may also get them into problems or, or make bad mistakes. Um, lots of emotions that feel pleasant and lots of emotions that feel unpleasant. And if we were to simply say... I'm going to continue to do this because it feels pleasant emotionally, and I'm not going to do these things that are unpleasant, we won't be able to gain equilibrium because sometimes we need to go through emotions that are unpleasant. We have to face them. We have to be able to face that type of energy. Sometimes there are pleasant emotions, sometimes there are unpleasant emotions. The only way, you know, the way to work with that is, is you have to use your thinking brain to, to rationalize, well, I sometimes have to go through an unpleasant emotion. And then the motor instinctual sexual center might be related to somebody who is um, orientating their life towards traditions and customs and values that are just placed there because it's their culture, it's their community, it's their, the religion that they grew up in, the beliefs, the flag that they adhere to. And there's not really even an emotional sense towards it, and there's not even really an intellectual sense to it. It's just, it is because it is. That's the way it's always been, and that's the way it'll be. Might be somebody who identifies with that as being the prime way of or orientating their problems in life. How, how am I going to figure out this problem? Well, I'll, go, I'll just look at what's traditionally done, right? So those are extreme examples. All of us are going to become unbalanced in one way or another when we're faced any situation. When we're faced with a problem in life, uh, we can think about it, we can have our feelings, and we can have impulses. It's like impulses sometimes are as simple as, you know, fight or flight, stay or go, this way or that way. And people may do something on an impulse or on a whim, and only later think about it, and only later feel about it. And they realize that the impulse, yes, I had that impulse, but now that, my, now that I'm thinking about it, that impulse wasn't guided correctly. It, it, it wasn't correct. It wasn't good for me. The, uh, the brains, we have to understand that the brains are, are like a machine, like a computer. And they operate in three different qualities of energy. Any machine can't do anything unless there's the energy inside of it. Like if, if you have a car or an engine, but you have no gasoline, then the, in, the engine's useless, right? 
if you have a computer but you don't have any electricity or a battery, then that, there's no use to it. So that's what those three brains are like. They're a machine, but they need to be animated. It's the consciousness or that soul that is animating that life principle that's going into those machines. And those machines just help, or they're, they're attuned to certain types of qualities of energy. Right? So the, the brains themselves are not the consciousness. The consciousness is what is animating those brains. And those brains are able to process certain types of energy. So every moment of our existence, we're coming across perceptions, impressions, and they're entering through our sense uh, organs, and they get filtered through different levels. And we respond, we can say in a primary sense, through an intellectual, emotional, or motor and single sexual uh, way. So when something hits us, when we're animated by life, when life activates us, in what way do we respond? We will find and we'll discover that sometimes we respond to a problem by thinking about it, ruminating. Thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. Some people might respond with their emotions, go become very dramatic. And other people may, re, may respond in an instinctual or motor way, very impulsively. So this is a way that we can begin to organize our experience. We should begin to reflect on how am I responding to life? How am I approaching life? How am I engaging in life? So we'll have a tendency to only use one brain and ignore the other ones. That's a problem. That represents not knowing the three forces. We don't, we, we don't know how to properly relate to them. So, the brains, in, the brains themselves are these machines, and they have actually three parts to them as well. So every, every part of our brain actually has the other two parts, or, de- or three parts to it itself. So we know, in, in the other slide, we spoke about the three brains being representative of external, internal, and abstract relations. So within every one of our brains, sometimes we say that inside the intellectual brain, there's the motor instinctive sexual aspect, the emotional aspect, and the intellectual aspect of the same intellectual brain. Right? So those three exist in all three brains. Another way we can use different words is that external, internal, abstract. So, for example, uh, how do we use these different brains? So, for example, if, if I'm uh, a dancer, or very artistic, if you want to learn how to dance, what brain do you have to be using? If a dancer wanted, came up to there and was using their intellectual center in order to do all the movements, it wouldn't look right. They would be very wrong, right? And this is because these brains operate with different types of energy. If you want to dance, you have to use your motor center, obviously. But you also have to use your emotional center, right? Because it's an expression of what's internal. So the dancing would be related to the motor center, but also related to the internal aspect of the motor center, because it's an expression, right? The, these three brains work at different speeds as well, and this also causes us to have a lot of problems. Our intellectual center is what we are able to kind of view very, probably the easiest, because we have thoughts and we can relate them to words and everything, so we have a lot of inner... Our inner uh, experience, sometimes we relate very much to our intellect. It's harder to put, it's harder to realize what's going on emotionally. Emotions to get, it, you might put some words to it, but you might also fail to put words to it. It's very difficult in that sense. It's because, it, in part, because the emotional center 
operates at a speed that's much faster than the intellectual center. So the person who's trying to dance, if they're trying to in intellectualize how to do the dance, they're going to be doing it all off pace and off speed and rigid because it's going too slow. And the motor, instinctive, and sexual centers are progressively even faster. The sexual center is the fastest. It's so instantaneous. We barely have an ability to be cognizant of it. That sexual impulse or attraction or repulsion just happens much faster than we're able to see. The slower the center, the more it's easy to work with that center. The more it's easy to modulate the energy in that center. Because there are parts of ourselves which are unconscious, and there's a little part of ourselves which is conscious. So when we respond with this in a certain center, unconsciously we're just reacting to life and responding. With a little bit of consciousness, we can modulate that. We can change that. We can, instead of react, we can act with consciousness. So if you look at the intellectual center, it's even difficult for us, for most of humanity, to control the intellectual center. Any one of us can do an exercise of telling yourself, I don't want to think about anything for the next five minutes, just to have that as a goal. It's very difficult. But that's a process to, to learn how to do that, because the consciousness can operate in any of these centers, and if you learn to work with the intellectual center, you can learn how to make that center obey. It's just a machine. And if we're not conscious, all of our unconscious elements, which we don't know about because we don't have self-knowledge, operate that center mechanically and use up energy very wastefully. Just, just wastes all of our energy. So, nevertheless, the intellectual center being difficult is also the easiest center to begin to have some control over, to manage. And the sexual center is the most difficult. In order to illustrate the different speeds or frequencies of these machines, um, I have an example. When I was, uh, I was doing the dishes one day, and I didn't realize that the, the water was scalding hot. I, was, I didn't realize it. So I, I put my hands under there, and immediately... I don't even know why, but my, my knee kicked forward. And I, obviously, I, I put my hands back, but my knee kicked forward and slammed into the cabinet under the sink. So that this instinctive and motor centers immediately active. Then I felt, oh my God, you know, I'm in pain or I hurt. I felt an emotional sense of fear or surprise or whatever it is. And then I began to be able to think about it, to reflect intellectually in the thoughts that are bubble out from that emotional sense. So you can see how the motor center is the fastest. The emotional center is faster than the intellectual, but the intellectual center is the last thing that starts churning. And it churns out those thoughts. Even though the thoughts seem like they come so fast, they're the slowest. We think, the thoughts, we think thoughts are so powerful but they're the le they are the ones with the least power. It's not to say that thoughts correctly managed aren't powerful. They are, but it's the slowest center. Another example for, uh, is, I give this example a lot, if you're typing on a keyboard or playing the piano or something like that, you're typing on a keyboard, that movement of energy, if you are trying to think where to type every letter, it gets very slow, and it doesn't work very well. You only get this if you know how to type, like, instinctually, through the motor center. If, you, if you're typing, if you're, you're just typing, and you're not thinking about where you're putting every key, it operates very smoothly. You're not using your intellectual center to move your fingers for each key. It's happening through the, the motor center, right? So this is how we have to learn how to use the right centers. When we're driving, driving is actually mo should be more of a motor center. It doesn't mean that we should turn off our intellect and emotions, 
But if you're using your intellectual center and someone jumps out in front of the road, if you're truly just in your intellectual center, you'd be too slow. You wouldn't be able to react fast enough. Your motor center and your instinctual center could react much faster. Sometimes we use our emotional center to, to drive. And that's when you usually get into accidents because we speed. We're speeding because we want some type, we're in relationship to some type of emotion. We're afraid of being late, right? So we speed. Or we just like that rush related to an emotional sense. So that emotional center is there looking for that, sen- that emotional experience or is acting out of some type of fear or ambition in the emotional center, and that causes us to get into an accident. So we need, to, we need to acknowledge and realize, become conscious of how these centers are operating with each other. If someone once asked me about driving, he says, I can't drive being conscious because then I'll be too slow. I'll, I'll, I'll get into an accident. But that person was mistaking consciousness for the intellect. They thought to be conscious and to be present and to be aware was to sit up here in your brain and think and have an intellectual kind of dialogue with yourself. That's, that's actually not it. Consciousness is different. We have an idea, for example, when we meditate, that somehow we're, the, we're, we're meditating and it's very cerebral. We, this is a Western thing. Most, most people in the West are seeing meditation as a cerebral thing. Maybe because of all these brain scans that we see today, which are fine. Obviously, things are going on in the brain. But in the East, meditation is, is about the heart. This is, this is the center of intelligence. If you, if you were to talk about meditation and start pointing to your head, some, peop, some, some people in the Eastern cultures would be like, what are you, what are you doing? This is, meditation is here. Of course, it's, it's, related, to our, it's related to all the centers but it's not an intellectual thing. So there's a lot that we can say about the, the centers. I wanted to talk about this term here, Bobin Kandelnosts, which is a term that Gurdjieff used. All it means is that there is a certain number of values or a certain amount of gas in the tank that each of our brains have. <coughs> Gurdjieff uh, made the analogy of a spring inside a, a watch, a mechanical watch, and each spring is uh, twisted or calibrated to perfectly count a day or an hour or a minute, whatever it would be. And once that spring is done, the spring's done. It has to be rewound. We can relate this as either, you know, gas in a tank or there's a certain amount of battery life that you have on your cell phone, right? We are, we are given a certain amount of, of this energy for each brain. And when those, when those values are exhausted, the brain begins to die. So there's this term here, death happens in thirds. And as we, if we have the fortune to grow older, we can see sometimes somebody's physical body begins to fail before their emotional or their reasoning do. Other times you may see someone physically somewhat healthy, relatively healthy, but their mind begins to go. Other people you may see emotionally, physically they're okay, Intellectually, they're okay, but emotionally, they're dead. They're, they're, there's something not right there. So we have to be careful to conserve our values. Uh, extreme cases would be, for example, an athlete, someone playing football or something like that. A very extreme motor brain existence or working in a very physical manual labor. We have to be careful because we're going to have a certain amount and the body begins to break down and then you have a lot of problems with your physical body later on. An emotional center uh, depletion uh, might be somebody, you know, as a profession, might be like an actor or an artist, and they are so invested emotionally, expending their emotional center repeatedly, that they lose, they lose that, or they become unbalanced. There's two sides to that. One, one could be just an emotional deadness, another could be really 
this extreme unbalance of emotions. And this is related to some mental illnesses. It could be related to some people who develop psychosis. And, you know, not from a professional standpoint, but just an emotional. So if someone's always an emotional person, they have a lot of relationships or they're getting into an emotional argument a lot, it's the same type of thing. Um, and then finally, the intellectual center. A lot of business and commerce is, is related to the intellectual center. But if you're constantly living just through the intellectual center, you can begin to lose your intellect. You can overextend yourself. And a lot of things can happen. There's two, there's two sides of this because there are the overall amount of values that we have for our whole life. But there's also a frequency at which those values are doled out to the brains in a, in a cycle. So for example, in a particular day, you need to know if you're overextending yourself intellectually. When you begin to get weak, like if you have a, if you have a, a day or a job where you have to think a lot, you have a lot of analysis or working with numbers or that type of thing, where you have to think a lot and reason, you have to begin to be aware that am I, I, need to, I need to shut down my intellectual center. I'm done. If you have a job that's constantly overextending your intellect, or if you're using your job in a way because you're identified, you could be, you're expanding yourself too much. You have to figure out how to rebalance your life in that sense. Because when the body gets depleted of the energy or the fuel that for the intellectual brain, that nourishes the intellectual brain, but you continue to use it, you'll begin to damage yourself, and you'll pull from other, other brains. You'll pull the fuel out of the other brains, and they'll run the intellectual brain, but it won't run it in the right way. You'll actually begin to further disequilibrate yourself. You start pulling from the other centers of the body. What's happening today, which is extremely extremely sad in this, in this world is that we are, comp we are depleting ourselves sexually, which is the, the, the finest and the most powerful energy that we have. People continue to expel and ex uh, ex exhaust themselves sexually, and they're just pulling from the emotional center and pulling from the intellectual center, beyond the fact that they're pulling from the sexual center. That's one thing, because we need to learn how to transmute our sexual energy. But at least... As a humanity, we could, we could find some balance to not pull from the other centers. That causes grave mental illness in many people when they do not know how to use their sexual center. They become identified with the sexual impulse and through you know, pornography, masturbation, or just many types of random sexual encounters. Living a life like that, this is not an ethical thing. This is not you're a bad person because you're doing that or that. What I'm saying is if you use the energy, it will pull from the other centers and you will become depleted. And you won't have the energy to remain balanced. And we get this life as a predetermined sum of values. You use it, it's gone. Unless perhaps if you do a really serious spiritual work, you might get some extensions. You might get some additional time. That can happen. But we don't need to put ourselves in that situation. When we pull from the sexual, when we put those other thing, other types of energy into the sexual center because we're depleting ourselves, we will become very unbalanced emotionally. We become extremely subjective in our thinking. The, the, the rational center becomes more subjective. The, the thinking center becomes... Uh, less and less, uh, it can less and less find any value of kind of the higher truths in life and becomes more and more sensual. Intellect only operates in terms of sensations and materialistic values and becomes more and more subjective. Sub means down. So the intellect becomes infected because it's depleted even more. And then we develop theories which just reinforce the type of sexual behavior that we feel like having. So this is, that's, that's the origin of this um, quote here, death happens in thirds. Death is a, a part of life. You know, we were born and we will die. But we have to do our best to live our life in, in the most harmonious way possible.
So I wanted to uh, end by just talking about the three traitors, which I'm going to go back to this image to talk about the three traitors. There's a, this lecture is only an introduction to the ideas that can be further elaborated in more lectures. Because the first primary goal of this work is to acquire psychological equilibrium. And what that means is to have a balanced behavior or balanced response in the three brains at all times. So when any type of impression hits us, when, a, when we get a bill and we don't have the money to pay it, what happens? We, have, we, have, we react in our emotional center. We might go into fear. Right? So there's every single reaction we have, we have to look at it. How is it. Where is it going into my three brains and how am I responding to this? We need to learn how to walk, that, walk on this path with balance. So life is trying to hit a, it's hitting us from every angle and we're getting unbalanced by becoming identified or using the energy in the wrong way in one of these three brains. And we have to learn how to become aware, to self-observe, and to find that balance, to restore that balance. So when we, we do the work to restore that balance, we're becoming conscious of how the mechanics in our, in our body and in our soul are working. So that's what psychological equilibrium means. It's actually, it's a lot of work to reach that spot, but it's, it's completely possible. It's a work of becoming conscious. It's, it's a conscious work. You cannot get there by thinking about it. You can't get there by having extreme uh, emotions or, or, or you can't get there by using your motor brain to just physically be here in a classroom or something like that. All those things might be necessary, but the consciousness is what needs to be worked. It's the consciousness. And there is no replacement for conscious efforts. The conscious efforts is not something intellectual. People say, what does that mean, to be conscious? And you can try to describe it, but it is a different dimension. It's not intellect, it's not emotions, it's not instincts or sexual impulses. The consciousness is behind that or within that already. It's a stream of energy within that. And we have this capacity to be basically present, to basically perceive. And we can perceive our three brains, and we can see what's going on. Am I, am I feeling emotionally distraught? Am I carrying this emotional weight or depression with me from, for a long time? Am I worried about something, but my intellectual brain says you shouldn't be worrying about that, so you're repressing the emotional brain? And then something happens, and you may have a little crisis or get hysterical or, or something happens that, that finally you can't suppress that emotion anymore and then it explodes. It's because we weren't, playing, we weren't being conscious of the three brains. And it's, it's very complicated, right? Because we may have the ideal of being a spiritual person where I'm going, to be, I'm going to have this conscious response to life. And intellectually, we hold on to that very heavily. So we deny the fact that in reality our emotional brain is sick or we're feeling emotionally sick or that we may justify our behaviors and we'll rationalize like, well, I can do this because I know better and I'm just doing it because I want to. Or I'm okay to do this behavior. So we use the intellect to like rationalize behaviors that we know we shouldn't do. And at the same time we hold the other thought, I'm, a good, I'm doing the right thing, I'm doing the right thing. So we can hide from ourselves. The different brains just work mechanically. And our unconsciousness will just take hold of them and use them as they wish. Samuel Unvior states that the there are two primary forces that work themselves through the human machine. And one of those forces is our egos, right? our unconsciousness. But that's actually the secondary force. The primary force that works through the human machine, Samuel Unveor states that it's the cosmic influences that we have, those cosmic rays that I was talking about. They influence us, and we don't even realize it. So an example he gives, for example, is like the Bolshevik Revolution, which is a, a revolution 
and related to communism. All of those individuals maybe thought that they were having this grand idea to have a revolution. But that idea was only thrusted into their consciousness because their machine was influenced at a cosmic level related to the organization of the stars. We can see today there's been a lot of uh, type of war and revolutionary type of movements in the Middle East, right? And things are kind of getting difficult. And how does a whole population of people change? Or, for example, the, um, the whole hippie movement and the sexual revolution. Everybody thought maybe perhaps they all had the same idea at the same time, but it was a cosmic influence that caused certain elements to, uh, to rise up. Those elements already existed, but those elements rise up into the emotional brain or into the intellectual brain and act. We have all these influences within ourselves we don't even know about. We have no conception of it. So we have so little amount of consciousness. So it's the cosmic rays that are first and foremost influencing us because they influence the whole world, the whole society at a time. But then the other layer of influence is, is our ego because the cosmic rays bring those egos into the light to, to take hold of our three brains. Because these three brains are like Three vehicles. So as you can get into a car and drive the car, right? But who's driving the car? Who's driving the emotional center? Depends. It could change from moment to moment. Why do we change our mind? Why do we feel one thing today and another thing tomorrow? It's because it's a different part of ourself, unconscious part of ourself, an ego. One ego gets out of our emotional center and another ego enters in. So one day we're very into one thing, and the next day we don't want that anymore. We're into this. And we could have one ego in our emotional center and a different ego in our intellectual center. We have great conflict between what I think I should do and what I feel I should do. And another thing about whether I should stay here or I should run away. Right? So you, you can see how a single response could have three contradictory things or even more. And this is the, like an introductory way of looking at how these three brains operate because our ego or multiple egos go into these centers, operate, and then another, another ego comes in and pushes that one out and feels differently. Those egos are influenced by the cosmic rays and they're influenced by the impressions coming in. So as a whole... Attempting to do this work, these three brains represent the three forces. Because those three forces are the basic manifestation of how creation exists. Those three forces multiply and become more and more complicated. But finally, when we reach a three-brained machine like us, we can have the ability, the capacity to become conscious of all three of those forces. So that's why... Only a, only a humanoid, only a rational person like ourselves can do the spiritual work. An animal has a spirit and a soul, but they cannot do the spiritual work. A plant has a spirit and a soul and a physical body, but it cannot do the spiritual work. Only a three-brained being can do the spiritual work. So we should reflect on that and, and notice how precious our time is to do that. Because we have the capacity. We have the machinery but we won't have it forever. If we, don't, if we don't do a conscious work and create an internal, developed, solar body, a solar soul, to be born again, then this physical body will go away. Our sense of emotions, our lunar astral body will go away. Our mental body will go away. And we'll be reduced to that elemental again. Because all of these things we think that are ours, we think it's my mind, but that mind, that mechanical process is given to us. It's a complication of energy. I think it's my emotions. That emotional center, we didn't develop that. That was given to us. So we have to do a work to become conscious. It's a conscious work. And that consciousness conserves the energy flowing through those three brains. If we're, if we're mechanical all day, and we're just thinking and thinking and thinking. At the end of the day, we'll be exhausted, right? This is common. 
We're having a lot of emotions, drama. At the end of the day, we're exhausted because we were identified. Our sense of self was inside that, caged up, and the, and the ego always wastes all the energy, always wasting the energy. Becoming conscious, we conserve that energy. Becoming conscious, we don't waste it anymore. And when we begin to conserve that energy, that energy can nourish ourselves in a certain way that allows us to be present and awakened outside of our physical body. Because outside the physical body, we need a certain type of energy to be conscious in that, in, that, in that presence. We can only be conscious outside of the physical body if we have the energy to do it. If you are emotionally sick or intellectually drained, or if you're not using your sexual center correctly, there's, you won't be able to have that experience. There will be no energy for it. So our ego, when it manifests through those three brains, we call it the three traitors. Because it's those three traitors that are, that are betraying those three forces, which we call Christ. So we betray the Christ intellectually, we betray the Christ emotionally, we betray the Christ through our own behaviors and actions and sexual behaviors. And you can see uh, in the very gospel, Jesus is betrayed in different ways. Jesus is betrayed by Pilate. And Pilate washes his hands of any wrongdoing. He says, this isn't my fault. And literally, in the, in, the, in the Bible, he washes his hands because we justify our behaviors. We do something wrong, but we find an intellectual reasoning that we can find safe haven from. It was okay that I did that. They deserved it in a simple term. We'll have a very complex set of reasoning sometimes. But that reasoning hides us from the fact that we're actually not doing the right thing. And in a, a sexual way, instinctual way, we just go with some, some random impulse that we have that betrays the Lord. And that's represented by Judas, who just, who trades the Christ for 30 pieces of silver, or in synthesis, any type of drunkenness or fornication, or just wasting energy for pleasures. And then the elder, or the chief priest, uh, Caiaphas, betrays us emotionally and through evil will, through doing evil in the name of God. It's the worst thing of them all. We justify, we, we have that kind of impulse and we attribute it to the Lord. So these three traitors are working through us all the time in very little ways and very significant ways at the same time. And it's a long process, but eventually you destroy those three traitors and eventually the culmination of the path, you perfectly incarnate those three forces. Not just physically, but through the soul and spiritually as well. And then when you have those three forces incarnated, that type of spirit or monad can manage a planet or manage a solar system or greater and greater systems and eventually get lost in the bosom of the, of the cosmic father, the absolute abstract space. I think I'll end there. You guys have any questions in the back? Uh, you mentioned the uh, freedom sum of vital values in Bob and Catalan's. Uh, is it comic? Does it become a karma or we all get the same amount? Well, everything is karma. So, does everyone have the same amount? No, I think, I think certain people have varying amounts. There may be um, people who have more values in their uh, motor instinctive sexual brain. They, they are able to last as an athlete much longer. Uh, everything's related to karma. But we have enough to do the work. So you don't have to worry about whether we have enough or not. And plus, when we're, if we're doing the work, we can have an extension, you know. Just like this world, you can file for an extension on things, even those laws. So, that also happens in this... I mean, of course, yeah. 
I mean, we can see their genes and our genetic code is related to this as well, you know, and it can be determined. It's some, there is some influence related to past lives as well. Of course, yeah, I mean, it's all wrapped up in karma. But like I said, I, we all have enough. We just waste it. You know, if we were very conscious, we'd be able to live much longer. <clears throat> In the past, humanity's lived for a lot longer. So from a, a, a type of, a different type of evolutionary process, the, the, our physical bodies are becoming sicker and sicker and not producing as much vitality as they should because it can't bring the energy in. It's not there. So <clears throat> it's, it's related to all of those things. Right, so the conservation of energy, uh, emotional energy, for example, we have to have the right balance. And there are forces that are existing. For example, an emotional impulse is coming out. And it, what do we have to do to not feel that? You have to put some other type of energy into it, right? So that additional energy to repress it or to not feel it, that's another energy. It's in that is in and of itself a waste. But what's the opposite, right? We, we have these two poles where uh, some people may react to this idea of um, conserving or not becoming totally identified. Like if you have an emotional impulse, you should express it. You should own it. Be yourself. That's you. Because the opposite is to repress it, right? But whether we, if we blindly express something, we become identified with it and we waste energy. But if we blindly repress it, we actually waste energy as well. And we, that, that impulse still is inside of us, but we actually involve um, more of our consciousness going, becoming subconscious. Yes. Right. So we have, to, we, we have to know, it sounds almost strange, but we can have a control of our emotional center to, to know how to open it up, to feel more intensely, and how to know how to constrict it, and when to not put that feeling into, you know, to know how to match our brains with what's appropriate. So for example, if you go to a funeral, most people are very identified emotionally, um, but you can have the understanding, I need to open up my emotional center and feel this grief, but the grief is not my totality, and I can, that's okay. That grief is there. I need, to, I need to observe its action and its activity within myself. Wouldn't it be good to go to a funeral that you knew, that someone you loved, and not feel anything? Right? That wouldn't make any sense. We would, so we need, so there's, a myriad of examples, right? So we need to learn how to live. Everything is a little bit different. It's about being balanced. It's not about conserving as in not having. Right. Because when you say conserve, it's like, well, if you want to conserve money, you don't use Right, money. yes. So, the, so a, energy is naturally not wasted when we're not overly identified. Because when the ego takes control, it runs rampant and just wastes energy over ev on, on everything. There, there, there's two different things. The vital, the vital values get developed because the, the three brains get developed through adolescence and puberty, and finally, the, you know, the intellectual brain is not really fully developed until you're 
maybe 20 or 25. Um, we know that, for example, the motor brain gets developed first. First the instinctual brain. First the, the child learns how to use their bodily, bodily functions, and then they learn how to walk and run, and little kids are running around and running around and running around because their motor brain is being developed. And um, then, you know, Uh, in the intellectual and emotional brains are getting developed as well. The kid starts asking why, 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 why this and why that. They start falling in love or something like that. So the brains are developing and maturing uh, until 20, 25, depending. But those values are determined for that particular, that physical body. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, the next life that you have, you'll have a new set of those values. Uh, of course, everything's related to karma, so if you wasted them, you know, you might have a different, a different amount or something like that. Not, nothing escapes karma, but I don't know, I don't have any specific information or knowledge about how one specific brain might be, have a different amount of values or not. The cosmic rays are just a level of influence that... So, for example, if I shine a fluorescent light onto different things, it makes certain types of materials fluorescent, right? Like a dark, a dark light or something like that. So the material is already there. It just activated a certain principle of energy that now makes it fluorescent, right? In the same way, these radioactive waves cause a fluorescence of our psychology. So for these different cosmic influences cause a, a radiation or a fluorescence within our own psychology, and those are the egos that become active. And this is how an entire nation can all of a sudden become overcome and infected with a negative type of emotion, a negative impulse. It's not that the cosmic ray is negative, it's that that principle within the psychology is a duality, and we are captured by the lunar part of it. So we're just pulled in the direction. You know, so for example, if the Earth needs to pull a lot of energy back into itself, and we as an essence happen to be connected to that energy, well, we as an essence are going down into the hell, hell realms, inferno. It's the way it is. But if we liberate ourselves out of that, then we can go up. And so we have to take advantage of that fluorescence, that radioactivity that's happening in our psychology, because um, those are the elements that we need to become liberated of. They can provide a lot of uh, knowledge. You know, it's the same duality. We've, we can, if we, if we overcome in the ordeal, we can't. We, we acquire knowledge. If we don't overcome the ordeal, then we have to. We get carried down. Yeah, so I mean, if you go to the gym and we use very heavier weights, we'll gain bigger muscles, right? It, or if we have um, a thing of rocket fuel, we can either get to the moon or we'll end up killing ourselves. <laughs> it'll blow up, right? It's a lot of fuel. So it, it's like that kind of duality, right? So we have to take advantage of this fact that we might, this society might be becoming very materialistic. It's a double-edged sword. It might be a lot of weight, but we actually can train our consciousness a lot more effectively. When you talk about cosmic rays, you're talking about the astrological influences, correct? Or these are different? They're astrological influences, yeah. Okay. So yeah, related to the zodiacal houses. Everything's related to that. I mean, that's Christ as 12 okay. and 24. So those... Uh, those stars that we externalize as the zodiac are the physical vehicles of those 12 principles. So a zodiac, a zodiacal house may be a certain number of stars. And that, but that vehicle, the energy coming from that is not from one star, it's from the, that whole constellation of stars. And it's, it's, it's a bit difficult for us to comprehend. We have to, we have to meditate on that.
Anything else? Yeah. Right, so the three traitors betray our inner Lord. So the drama of Christ happens within ourselves at different levels. Right, so in the very first level, it's, it's related to these spiritual impulses that we have, which will bring us back to the light. But we have this ego, this subjective intelligence and emotions and impulses that betray those laws and cause, uh, cause the Christ to suffer and be crucified and, and you know, through a process of resurrection is redeemed. So they're just, those three traitors are three principal ways in which we have wrong thinking, wrong feeling, and wrong actions. So the demon of desire, the demon of the intellect, and the demon of evil will. We have those things within us. And they're there. We have to acknowledge that there's a battle going on inside of us. This is something that most people don't want to see. They want to either see, this is who I am, these are my impulses, and this is how I should behave. Why should I deny that? But if you want to liberate yourself from those impulses, if you want to have full consciousness, you have to fight against it. And this is why we were teaching all these things. You know, we have to, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated work. But we do all the, the things necessary. You know, our med- meditation, sexual transmutation, and developing, development of com- compassion and goodwill. Doing good things for others. Does that make sense? Yes. Still got the one there. Cleaning, uh, like Say it again. We have to become psychologically balanced, right? What that means is that our consciousness is the one directing our behaviors, as opposed to our subconsciousness, our egos, doing things. We have willpower. We have a lot of willpower to sit in front of some television screen for hours, sleep, watching the screen and becoming identified. Their emotions become my emotions. And I... and we even want the manipulation of our emotions just to feel something. And, but we have very little willpower to sit down and look at the screen of our own mind. It's, it's, it's abstract or boring or difficult because our willpower is locked up in all these, uh, we call it egos. Each of those egos want to be fed by certain types of impressions. And we sit to meditate, it's not the impressions that the egos want, so we have very little willpower to do our spiritual practices. But we... We start where we start, with our little bit of willpower, a little bit of, of imagination and emotional capacity, and we begin to comprehend and, uh, and liberate our consciousness little by little. We have more and more of it. And we slowly eliminate those three traitors. And that's... When we achieve psychological equilibrium, then we can really be working on our ego. If we're, if we're, if we're being swayed back and forth and we don't have equilibrium emotionally or intellectually, or sexually, then we, we don't have the equilibrium to stay and to, and to view. You know, if the, if the ego is this moving entity, we have to be the things to be focused, to see it. But what happens is we get trapped by that, that movement, become identified, become one with that ego, and now we're dreaming and swaying and, and just mechanically behaving in life. Okay. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.